Mark, is eighth grade better than seventh? Not really. What about ninth? All of junior high school sucks. High school's better. It's closer to college. They'll call you names, but not as much to your face. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We're at episode 137, back to Cole's Choice. What are we doing today? Well... This one's a little special because in addition to the movie that I chose, this is our fifth anniversary show. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary to you too. We've been at this for five years now, almost unbelievably, it feels like sometimes. Yeah, it feels like 20. (laughs) Well, I have seen a (laughs) lot of other shows come and go in this span of time. So thank you for continuing to talk about and watch these movies with me. It's not always easy or convenient to turn out a regular episode and then a Patreon episode on time every week. So I'm really grateful to you for sticking with me through all this. And since I mentioned Patreon, and it's our fifth birthday, I wanted to mention that at the top of the show, before the housekeeping section, where everyone just turns it off. I know I do. (laughs) Just kidding again. We offer a lot of bonus content and other perks at patreon.com slash magiclantern. And the format there is much more loose. So in addition to film, we talk about television, music, our travels. I read spooky stories at Halloween, all kinds of stuff. So if you feel like supporting us that way, we would greatly appreciate it. And on to the show. What I chose this time is Welcome to the Dollhouse from 1995. That's written and directed by Todd Salons, and it stars Heather Matarazzo, Matthew Faber, Brendan Sexton III, and Eric Mabius. It is a deep black comedy about the unfortunately named Don Wiener and her struggles to maintain her middle school dignity while being beset on all sides by outrageously cruel classmates, petty and vindictive teachers, and disinterested parents. Now this won the grand jury prize at Sundance in 1996 and it garnered a lot of press at the time. Do you remember all that buzz about it? I sure do. I was finishing college at the time, and I was very much aware of the independent scene, as it was. And I saw this in terms of its marketing and ads for it, but I didn't watch it. And that was for a very specific reason. I was concerned, not because of what I had read, but because of how the film seemed to be portrayed, that the movie itself would degrade and insult dawn and then it would just be too uncomfortable for me to sit through so watching it for this episode was the first time you've laid eyes on it yes well i wanted to talk about it now because it's the kind of movie that feels like it's getting a little bit lost like it's falling off the map somewhat and i wanted to do my part to prevent that because i feel like it is a modern classic and very much a rosetta stone for contemporary films about adolescence i see all sorts of things flowing from this So how about we get right into it? Definitely. We begin with that family photo on the wall and that slow push in on Dawn. And it's the only time, I think, in the movie that we see her smile like this. And right away, I feel like the film is giving us a bit of a Rorschach test. How does this feel to you? Is it forced to smile? Is she genuinely happy? Well, that photo, coupled with the credits, it's sort of like calligraphy, like an invitation, inviting us to get to know the family, but the picture that they want to show us. What initially occurred to me and what I wrote down first was how incredibly cute she is with her dimples and her big smile. I just love her. Here's what I think about this picture. I think it was taken the year before Missy really found ballet, (laughs) Missy being her little sister. Dawn has a nice dress to wear that fits. I'm going to talk about costuming a little bit later. And it shows. I still think, though, when we look at that font for the credits, she was probably forcefully directed as to how she should appear. But the smile seems real to me. 
because like you said, she doesn't really smile otherwise, and certainly not because anyone tells her she should or must. I think it's a little bit different for me each time that I see it. I feel extremely protective of this character. She's very much in that little sister mold for me, plus she is a classic underdog. I think I also know why you like her so much. Okay, why is that? Because she has that little indentation between her brows when she's thinking, and I know you love that. (laughs) That's true. I really do pull for her. Because of all that, I think I ultimately default to a bleakly optimistic read of this photo. I think of it as exhibiting genuine happiness, but more of the type that's a blissful ignorance of what is to come. Something that she might reflect back on as a high watermark in her life. And that mix of feeling, I think, is very important because I describe this as a black comedy, but that's only really about half the picture. It's quite serious and I think sensitive about how it treats this girl and what she goes through. Salons himself, he said he conceived of it as a remedy to the fact that he really didn't know of any American films that dealt in a serious way with childhood. And I think that prize at Sundance was just one of the things that indicated he was right. It hit a nerve that people really responded to. He was hoping that it would get his foot in the door to have a career making after-school specials. I think he says that almost a little self-deprecatingly, too, Mm -hmm. that at least he might get an after-school special because he was really defeated during the filmmaking process of his first film. And I know Don continues to resonate with people. Heather Matarazzo mentions all the time people coming up and talking with her. Yeah, I think he definitely tapped into the zeitgeist. And you could probably draw a straight line from this to something like the much gentler but still earnest Freaks and Geeks. A few years later, on through to contemporary analogs like 8th Grade. We probably don't have one of your favorites, Napoleon Dynamite, without Don Wiener putting this strain of awkwardness on the indie film radar. It certainly struck me as being different when I first saw it. I was 25 at the time, which was very much removed from middle school, but not so much that I didn't see what she was up against and the frankness with which Salons addressed that. Because it's not of the ilk of everything's going to be okay eventually. (laughs) Definitely not. I would advise young people to watch this only within a therapeutic setting. So maybe you can get some other perspectives. We see so much about it, even from just the opening interactions. Just something as simple as negotiating the indignities and the politics of trying to find a seat in the cafeteria. Now, I have to say up front, there is a lot of this that I don't relate explicitly to myself. I went to a very small school, too small for there to be cliques in the traditional sense. We all had our smaller friend groups within that, but my graduating class was only 52 people, period. So there weren't the same dynamics that you would see at much larger schools. Do you have any experiences that are closer to what Don went through? I went to much, much, much larger schools, and there were definitely cliques. And I feel for her, she's so brave because she still asks if she can sit down. She doesn't run and hide. She doesn't go eat her lunch in the bathroom, for example. But I didn't feel that same sense of having to eke out a place when everyone wanted me to just go away. I did, though, relate to that sense that people are watching me and not in a good way. People are evaluating me somehow. And I don't know if that was true or not. But I certainly never felt pretty enough or fast enough or interesting enough as these other people seem to be. I'm lucky, I think, that I figured out early on that it wasn't true that everyone was watching and observing because they're all wrapped up in their own thing too. And I think I had an innate understanding of that, luckily. Or maybe I just didn't care. I was born with that part of it instead. I think it's a little bit more of that (laughs) because they tune into you when they decide to, when they get bored or they feel kind of hungry in a certain way. But in general, though, I did have more self-confidence than Don does. Well, you definitely mentioned one of the things that I do love and relate to about her. In every instance, she stands her ground. There is no giving up, like you say, no eating your lunch in the bathroom, no rolling up into a metaphorical fetal position, even if the whole world is against her. And it certainly feels like that sometimes. She is at least going to go down swinging, and I absolutely relate to that part of her. 
How about other things that she might have that are relatable? What do you make of the things that she finds comfort in? Things like smart boys on TV quiz shows, wielding power over her baby sister. Is there anything else that you found notable about her methods of escapism? I'm thinking about those things over which she can exert some tiny amount of control in her life. Breaking those really kind of small rules, no drinking in the TV room when the parents aren't home, playing the piano when no one is around to yell at her, and specifically her clubhouse. It's this ratty place that she has made look the way she wants it to because the shared bedroom she has with Missy is all Missy. And her clothes, again, are what her parents think will make her look more inviting or are probably more befitting her station in life as they see it. I do think she picks out her hair ties, though. I think you nailed it. I think that is all so extremely relatable, no matter what your circumstance. When you feel like so much is beyond you, you hone your focus down until all you can see in the moment are these granular things that you can exert that control over. Even if it's just in daydreams, it's one of the most universally human things you can do, except for being outraged when that too is taken from you, which she also does. This fight slash tantrum that she has about the TV room that occurs off screen with her mom and her little sister, this sounds more real than any other example of a fight I think I may have ever recalled up to that point. That's the stomping of the foot. Her vocal intonations. Yeah, yeah it's perfect. That is still the moment that I feel in my bones as they are trying to do something different here. That's the first time it occurred to me. And then that cuts to the first instance of my absolute favorite recurring theme, which is Dawn just sitting and fuming. She's sitting on her bed with her little fist balled up, so angry with her angry music pounding on a soundtrack. And I know in her head, seeing pure red. By the way. That's an excerpt of the song Evening of Desire by the Undead, which seems perfect. I have to say, she's often right to feel that way because of the injustice of it all, of just being a kid. Her pint-sized understanding of the situation is certainly preparing her for certain lessons of adulthood, primarily that nothing is fair. But she's naive slash strong enough, depending on how you see it, to fight it. For instance, when she's cornered in the bathroom by one of her tormentors and she just quietly says, please let me go. It breaks my heart in two every time I hear that. She's appealing to reason. I'm innocent. Please don't do this. But bullying doesn't make sense. So being sensible in response is no advantage. It's the same thing when she asks, why do you hate me? Because you're ugly. Yeah, that's the response. But I think that example is even more illuminating than the please let me go part. Because the ugly thing, that's not exactly true. I don't see her as any more or less traditionally pretty than the character that says that to her, for instance. So what is it? What are the kids and some adults picking up on that makes her such an object of universal scorn and derision? I think that they've picked the simplest word. I don't think that they know misfit, and they don't have their own means of contemplation or self-reflection, but everyone knows what ugly means. And this is reflected in all of the interviews that you would see too. Critics asking her, how does it feel to play such an ugly girl over and over? So they're picking up on something. And Heather Matarazzo said, she really internalized that as how does it feel to be so ugly, which I can understand if you're constantly told this, this is what you hear. Yeah, the way that proliferated to me is just crazy. The way this expanded in such a meta way that even the press participated in this, it's just beyond my understanding. What are they watching? There is such an inexplicable alchemy to bullying. I just don't understand. When it comes to the adults, I think it comes back to this whole idea, again, that children can't express but adults feel, which is that I fear becoming what I think you are, or I was that, and I don't want to be that anymore. It's just reflecting back their own perceived inadequacies or failings. And then I also think sometimes, specifically for the parents, it's this idea that they've failed to make something beautiful. Well, that coming from the parents is probably almost too heavy for a child to want to acknowledge if they even understand it. But coming from other children, 
Why do you think some kids get singled out while other equally viable targets fly under the radar? Is there something to be said about the punching bag that brings it on themselves? The ones that draw unnecessary attention? The ones that don't know when to just shut up if they want to avoid this? What are the moving pieces you see there? I don't think any part of it is fair or makes complete sense. And I don't think a lot of people slip under the radar. I was looking at some statistics around bullying. Between one in three and one in four U.S. students say they've been bullied in school, and it almost exclusively happens in middle school. There are all these different at-risk behaviors of being bullied, and it basically covers everything. Being different, being overweight or underweight, wearing glasses or different clothing, being new, being unable to afford what other kids consider to be cool, being weak or being perceived as weak or unable to defend themselves, being depressed, anxious, low self-esteem, less popular, fewer friends, seen as annoying or provoking. I mean, it could go on and on and on. I think what's really interesting is looking at the types of kids who are more likely to bully than other kids. They have more social power. They're more connected to their peers. They're more dominant. But then you get the total other side, more isolated from their peers, more depressed themselves. And so basically, they're just passing it on. So basically, it's everyone and everything. I've been bullied. It was very small in nature. And I know that at some point, I have exhibited bullying behaviors too. Yeah, I suffered a couple of instances of it too when I was probably around that age. But it was nothing very severe. It was nothing that I didn't think about for maybe more than a couple of weeks, and then it sort of dissolved and went away. I still remember the name of the girl who bullied me, and it was one instance, and it's not that big of a deal, but it still bugs me. I still remember the names, too. But do your stats there say anything about the severity of the instances or the duration of the instances? Because to me, so much of what I went through, and on average what I saw other kids going through, really fell under the broader umbrella of, rub some dirt in it and walk it off, and you won't think about this a few weeks from now. There was kind of a larger study, and it said about 50% of the kids who reported being bullied said it occurred at least once during the past month. And I don't want in any way to make it sound like I'm making this out to be no big deal, because I know there are severe instances, and people are very severely affected by it. It's just another of those instances where I don't have a one-to-one -one correlation with it. So in light of what you're saying, I wonder how often Dawn's behavior was replicated by the average middle school student. Because like I said, she never wilts. And this is even when the other misfits lash out at her. She's made the decision about how to deal with her station in life. And she is the personification of that Winston Churchill aphorism. If you're going through hell, keep going. Now you brought up the parents just a second ago. And I want to throw teachers in here too, because I think... One of the most controversial but honest aspects of this are that some of the adults are as appalled by her as the kids. I don't feel this way about Dawn, quite the opposite, but I think teachers will tell you, if granted anonymity, some of your kids are hard to like. They're like adults that way. They're not hard to spot either. People tell you all about themselves without reservation, even if they don't know they're doing it. It's easy to walk into a room, and in five minutes, you can sense the ones that are most easily culled, I think. It doesn't require sadism. It just needs intuition and an understanding of people. Bullies can do it. Serial killers can obviously do it. Cult leaders build empires on it. But it's easy to do even if you have no intention of taking advantage of your ability to make those people out. I am a little surprised, in fact, at how they all instinctively turn on her because she exhibits a very specific strength to me. She's not exactly a passive victim. There are surely others that are much more blood in the water, let's say. But with these stats that you're telling me, how does anyone survive middle school? I have no idea, and I don't think that they do. <laughs> really, I don't. Is it a case of find your people and circle the wagons, basically? Do you want anyone to join our club even now? Hell no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I really think that huge swaths of the population don't actually survive it. And that doesn't mean that there's an actual physical death, maybe more of a mental death or a slow one. Because growing up is a big deal. 
It's a traumatizing experience and you can only do it by yourself. I just hope that people get some sort of help in the form that they need. That might be a friend or an outlet. For me, it was discovering academics and I could really bury myself in that. Maybe you have a supportive family, I hope. Or maybe you get some therapy or there's a big change in your circumstance. I don't know, but minus you, I do think people just keep acting that stuff out in unhealthy ways in other parts of their lives. Maybe I just went the wrong direction with it. Maybe I should have taken that Stephen King tack and written books about it for 50 years now right. and made a mint. Or become a cult leader of the sexy kind. <laughs> you know, there's a word that I never use in daily life, and I certainly didn't know it at the time, but I think microaggressions is appropriate here every day. Something to feel humiliated by, but spaced out enough so that you don't necessarily become a homicidal maniac at 12. Well, let's talk about her mindset a little bit. Let's talk about, for instance, the reliability of this narrator. It's all seen from Dawn's point of view. So do you believe that that is truly this intolerable, or is it even slightly amplified and exaggerated coming from an 11-year-old that is convinced the entire world is out to get her? Can I say both? Am I allowed <laughs> I to you would. pull one of those? I think that... All in all, she is self-absorbed in the way that kids are, in the way that she has to be because nobody else gives a crap about her inner thoughts, her feelings, or her actions. I think at least part of it is blown up, but even if one one-hundredth of it is accurate, that's enough for her to feel crappy about. I think the one detail that sticks out to me that makes it clear to me at least that this is a bit of an amplification, that it might not exactly be true, but rather how it feels to her is her locker. It is covered from top to bottom in obscene graffiti, but it stands out so starkly against row upon row of the other pristine lockers around it. There's no way if this was real that it would be allowed to remain like this. At the very least, they would make her clean it up. Now, our flip side to this, our previous episode was... Richard Linklater's boyhood, and if we wanted to compare and contrast this a little bit with that, I think, again, this is far outside my experience with siblings. There was no middle child in our house. You were an only child. Yeah, still am. <laughs> That's a great joke, Sorry. Dad. That's because we lost my younger brother at a very young age. Her brother, that relationship, it's not like my sister and I. He isn't cut off from her exactly. He's just on another planet. He's got his own thing going on, but he's receptive to her whenever she comes around to ask advice, and he does big brother things like get out of my room. Nothing off the charts. It's pretty standard the way they interact, I think. The other thing in terms of boyhood that I like about this comparing to that, or contrasting in this case, I think her face is like the flip side of L.R. Coltrane's inquisitiveness. What I see on her face is complete befuddlement and perplexity. It's... Innocence and naivete, they're there too, but they're doing battle with this resignation that sometimes comes with the onset of full adult understanding. It's that little O oh that her mouth makes, that it always falls into that pattern of just trying to take it all in. Like she's often caught by surprise? She can't form a word that can come out either. Almost like she just got the tiniest punch in the stomach. I think so. It's just this cosmic existential nightmare all the time. I do want to say before we go further, I don't mean to suggest that I'm down on the movie at all. I think it's great because Dawn is so great. And it didn't make me feel like I was wanting to burn the entire world down like I was afraid I would. Because of that sensitivity and the humor, it's so funny. I'm glad you brought that up because we are coming up on a part where... We are threading a bit of a needle in terms of that sensitivity. The introduction of the hunk Steve Rogers into her brother's band is pivotal. The band is the Quadratics, by the way. <laughs> I love this scene where she is descending through the house, following his siren song down, 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 through the shag carpet, through the paneling, through the rumpus room. I think this is the other reason that the film should be celebrated. I've seldom seen something so delicate and complicated handled as well as these stirrings that this junior varsity Jim Morrison brings out in her. 
Well, most, if not all of the songs do seem to have the word girl in the title. Mm -hmm. So it seems like he's really targeting somebody. The first inclinations of sexuality that come with adolescence, like I said, that is a tough needle to thread. But Salons does an incredible job here with little details and I think touching juxtapositions especially. Immediately following her first encounter with Steve, for instance, we see her with no glasses for the first time. There's the contrast of her being clad in footy pajamas while she's working out her interest in this older boy. She is dealing with wrapping her mind around the concept of horny and whether the girls that take part in this behavior have to be pretty. It all lands, I think, just right for this time in her life, and the way Salons writes this so sensitively is my main argument when I encounter those people that say he hates all of his characters. He clearly has affection for this character. She's on the brink, and he is taking care of her, I feel like, even while being completely honest in the writing. She just hasn't crossed that threshold quite yet. And I think their use of costume, especially to indicate who she is, where she is, is brilliant throughout this film. What do you think about her wardrobe and how it made you feel about her? I'm torn in a couple of places, because on the one hand, I'm all for wear whatever the hell you want, and chicken sweaters are as cute as Mickey Mouse, in my opinion. When I specifically look at her school wear, in contrast to her day wear at home, she's wearing almost exclusively dresses, and you can tell they're just starting to get tight. I'm thinking again about that family portrait, and I think a year or two ago, she was still under that preteen age and still maybe cute, according to her family, so she had those cute dresses that she's now growing out of. The footy pajamas, she should have left those behind a while ago, but I don't think her family will quite let her do that. I feel like, again, that day wear is pitched a certain way, and I don't know if I totally buy it. It almost seems like it's kind of pitching the joke a little too on the nose. But I think her hair ties, again, are definitely on purpose. That's the thing where she says, I'm moving forward in the world. So the choice is at least once or twice, maybe a little too arch, a little too reaching, like you said, on the nose, sacrificing something for the comedy to land. Well, I want to circle back to something that you said just a minute ago about the jokes and how funny it is, lest we forget or get too bogged down in the struggle of it all. The jokes are great. Dawn trying to hit that 100 word count on her essay about dignity. Dignity is a very important quality to have. That's why everyone should have dignity. Exactly. Her brother's garage band, the Quadratics, you mentioned them already, with all their squeaking and honking and that. I don't think satisfaction is supposed to sound like that. After they said that, after I stopped laughing, I realized I can't even remember what satisfaction is supposed to sound like now. <laughs> it's been replaced by this forever. Totally. That anniversary party cake. There are some laugh That's out loud moments. That's incredibly disturbing. That's <laughs> the most disturbing cake I've ever seen. I hope these comedic elements of it don't get overlooked. But back to the drama of the whole thing. The thing that is so hard for me to accept about this and about everything she's being told is that retaliation is never going to work. It's so frustrating. And I feel that just emanating from her. The person who shoots spitballs back is the one who is invariably going to get caught in this world. Her mother shamefully and ignorantly chides her for it. Whoever told you to fight back, she says. That perhaps would be the most confusing thing to me if I were Dawn in this situation. The answers seem so obvious and yet somehow they don't apply. It still does make me laugh though. I don't like the idea of someone having to come out on top because that means somebody's always going to be on the bottom. But when she knocks the ball out of the little kid's hands, <laughs> that is funny. Well, she's just trying so desperately, I feel like, at every moment to figure all of this out. Her mind is never at rest. And it comes down to one word for me. Ache. That's what makes this movie so hard to take, I think, for some people. This movie is one big ache. All of these things that are just beyond her grasp. You have to figure it out sometime. And she feels so much like she's ready to get on with it. But maybe she's not entirely. She's... Eager and fearless, though, in her own way, which, again, I love her for. And since her mind has taken a turn to these romantic things, she swipes Steve's school ID at one point here, and she builds a shrine to cast a spell on him. Take me away from this place, is what she's asking for. 
But then the band has a big blow up while she's watching rehearsal. Steve quits. There goes her chance. By the way, my favorite part and also a lot of other people's when she's dancing. Hmm. That's when she's fully herself. Nobody else is influencing her. I want to talk a little bit here about what she understands her options to be. We talked during boyhood about that very distinct feeling of, I can't wait to get out of here so I can do what I want. Do you think at this point in her young life, she understands what she can actually do for herself? Because so far it's things like, Steve will take me away, or trying to imagine herself plugged into her brother's path via school, for example. When do you think she becomes more fully aware of what she's able to implement on her own, her own vision for her life? We'll talk about this in a bit, but I think it's the trip to New York. It seems to be the one thing that's completely hatched in her brain. And I think it's the absence of her sister. Maybe she then can make her own place. Well, just like any time I think about it, it feels interminable waiting to get to that point where I can do what I want. It's just another reason that I don't think I'll ever understand the nostalgia merchants. I do not ever want to go back to any period of my life that had less autonomy. It's likely what I prize above all else. I see things like this and I wonder, what time period is it that people are romanticizing and actually want to go back to? I don't imagine it's the junior high years or high school. And you don't want to be five years old again either. So I think after much study, I've determined that the only thing fondly remembered actually by anyone that people want to transport back to are maybe a few individual specific great days and then the handful of weeks of summer between fifth and sixth grade. I'm with you. I was talking about this with somebody today and she described it as making moments. And I think we remember some moments. And generally they were probably when we were on our own. And I guess if you listen to a lot of other people when they were watching The Goonies. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because overall, it's the movies that have taught me that every other part of childhood or adolescence is terrible. I don't know if it's the same for you. And while we're on that subject, to go back to your bullying stats and stuff that you were talking about just a moment ago, something the film highlights that adults, I think, may have forgotten along the way is that the capacity for cruelty in kids is staggering. I think one thing that you might have left out of all of those cause and effect loops, in some cases, it's clearly the perpetuation of a cycle of abuse. I think that's the one thing I didn't hear when you were listing those reasons. But I think Brandon gives that distinct vibe of, I've been hurt, so I'm going to hurt you. Does it feel the same to you? It definitely does. And the one thing I didn't mention is that apparently those who have been bullied and those who are bullies are way more likely to have Mental problems, academic problems, behavior issues later in life. Both sides. Well, I think to the casual viewer, he is a severe case because Brandon explicitly tells Dawn he is going to rape her. This is a grim and scary thing, but I think that is in part because we're fully aware of the freight of those words. I don't know if it's the same for these particular characters. For instance, not quite fully understanding what all of these adult things mean makes her as curious about them as much as afraid of them. Did you read it that way? And do you think the ignorance of the full import of this is equal on both sides? For instance, does Brandon have truly any idea of what he's threatening? I don't think either of them know what it means and neither are prepared to execute it. It really startled me when I heard it. And I don't know if this is the whole attitude of kids today. I have this idea that kids now, at that age, understand what it means. Maybe that's just my prejudice. Maybe that kind of idea never changes, and I just would always assume the worst, or assume that they have more knowledge than they do. Thinking back as best I can to when I was 11 years old, I'm sure I was aware of the word, but I can tell you I had no idea what it meant. I remember doing a speech on date rape, when I was 14, I think a freshman in high school. So I understood it at that point, but it was really a different concept. I do know in an earlier draft of the film, he does actually rape her, but I still don't know what that means in terms of the characters or the creator. I think though that Don has some idea from Brandon that he doesn't mean actual violence in the threat. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that too. Do you feel like she has an instinct about there is something 
else under the surface with him, something that's a little more sympathetic? I do, or she's at least willing to give people the benefit of the doubt. And she certainly figures it out when she realizes that she said one of his sort of trigger words, that she's insulted his intelligence and that means something to him. Well, I feel like this thing with Don and Brandon is monumental in terms of universality. And I think especially when considering the experiences of girls and young women. So you can maybe shed greater light on this from your perspective. When it comes to things like first kisses and other similar experiences for young women, does an inordinate amount of those fall under the banner ultimately of it wasn't supposed to be like this? Not necessarily in a traumatic way, though I know that there are those definitely, but even in the sense of just, well, that certainly didn't live up to all my expectations. What else is she supposed to do? What else are any of us supposed to do? Just miss out completely? She's fearless, but she's also clueless, and that's okay. And I love this detail. Apparently, that was also Heather's first kiss. And Todd Solent said of her as an actress that she was always ready to push beyond expectations and was okay with making her parents feel uncomfortable. <laughs> they were always on set. And I think that comes out. She's ready to push forward, gain an inch, Anytime she can. It certainly comes through. I feel like Dawn is pushing those boundaries, but also simultaneously settling to gain some experience. You see it in how she's forging these approximations of adult scenarios. Even at this age, she knows what she wants it to feel like, and she knows that this doesn't feel like that. You brought this up just a little bit ago, and I was going to get some further clarification here. Do you remember your own cruelties as much as those that were visited upon you? I remember both. And some of those came flooding back to me over the course of watching the film and then us discussing it afterwards. And I do not want to relate them here. I don't want to think about them more. I don't want to bring them up. I think it's probably about 50-50 what was visited upon me and maybe what I delivered to others or probably, if I'm being honest, 70-30. <laughs> In terms of remembering the darkness that I had to go through in terms of really thinking about what I caused others to go through. Well, I don't think you're alone. I have some of that too. Again, that is very shameful to me, but I do think it is a very human thing to do to hurt someone because you are hurt. You pointed out she's not above passing it on to the younger kids in the neighborhood, knocking that ball out of their hands, even though it's funny. But more sadly, she is not above passing it on to her friend Ralphie, which I think is terribly sad. I hate that aspect of human nature. I hate it in myself. I just hate it. I don't want someone to be on the bottom always. I wish we would just get over that. I think it complicates her being a sympathetic character a little bit, too. And it's especially complicated by this longing to be on the other side. It's not so cut and dried. It's not just, I want this to stop. It's also, I want to be popular. And is that, do you think, just code for saying I wish things were easier? Or are there other components to that? I think it means I want to be loved and validated for who I am. Again, a very human impulse. And we talk a lot about the relatability of what she goes through. And I think you feel that a whole lot deep in your bones. I do wonder, though. Do you think that some of the audience for this experiences it from the other side? The things that we were talking about recognizing in our past, say if someone was a full-on bully, do they see this and recognize what they once were? How would they even come across this? Would they even seek out something like this? I think next time we have to watch it in a group and see who laughs at what <laughs> Okay. to maybe figure that out. Yeah, we both mentioned those times that are now shameful to us, what we did. I guess another bully would have to recommend it to their fellow bully as the funniest thing in the world. Otherwise, I have no clue how to answer that question. Oh, so you're picturing them as not having outgrown it. They are still part of the Bullies International Clubhouse. I think so. That's the way I always imagine those people. Maybe so. Maybe it's true. There are some people that never evolve past the person that they were when they turned 18. So maybe an important life lesson there. Because in addition to the jokes, we are racking up these lessons, too, as we go. Things that I like her cataloging and storing away. She is naturally suspicious of her family and this anniversary party that they want to throw, and with good reason. And I think the biggest thing that 
I take from it that I do relate to so clearly in this. She is learning that being smart is sometimes a disadvantage, not just not an advantage, not just neutral, but it puts you behind the eight ball if you are among a certain group that resent that in you, for example. I think the problem is she's not smart enough or she's not too smart. She doesn't have anything that she's excelling in. But she's smarter than the rest of them. She is way advanced in certain areas. That's true, but that's not hard to be in that circumstance. Yeah, it's a tough thing to come to grips with, I think. And all that comes to a head here with the anniversary party, which is one of my favorite scenes in the whole thing, because everyone's asking, where's Dawn? And finally, we see her peering out at the festivities from an upstairs window, and I got it. I think this is what really brought it home to me. She is the ghost that haunts this family. She is not a participant. She is not a member, although I do love her party outfit. Yeah, she gets all dolled up to try to get Steve. She puts on the clothes that will make her look older and more sexy and alluring, she thinks. And it's all totally her decision. Until she falls in the kiddie pool. Well, she gets pushed into the kiddie pool. On tape. Which she then destroys, which (laughs) is awesome. Well, we're in the home stretch here, and there's a little John Waters absurdity underneath it all that I especially feel in this section where Missy, the youngest child, goes missing. Now, I've heard people say that the difference between the two is that Waters loves his characters, where Salons hates his. And I've already made clear that I disagree with that. But how do you feel about it? I disagree with you slightly. I think it's way more about Todd Salons just hating the world and by extension, really everyone in it and himself most of all. And that could have been the time in his life. I mentioned his first film was a huge failure. He thought his acceptance letter to the Toronto Film Festival was a prank because he had shown it to people and they wouldn't even finish watching it. So he wasn't feeling great. There are two places I want to go here. One to mention John Waters. When you hear him talk, it's all about this making a community of misfits like him. I don't know that Todd Solence has that same idea or that same community. And then when you look at what he's done to the character of Dawn in the subsequent films, Palindromes and Wiener Dog, I think that he's given her a shitty fate. I think he used her to explore something that he's more interested in instead of maybe valuing the character a little bit more, but she is his creation. He can do with her what he wants to. And he certainly wasn't interested in, I think, going down the road of further exploring the audience, really identifying with her. He's not interested in that. He's interested in something else. Two things you say stick out to me there. With him wanting to treat this character that way, I think some of that may come from the way that Heather Matarazzo was similarly treated. This is all you know me for, so I want to kill it. Okay, interesting point. I hadn't thought about that. It's the same thing, say you're in a popular band, and the person on the street comes up to you constantly and wants you to play that one song over and over and over again till you never want to hear that thing again. The other thing being, I think the self-deprecation of it that you mentioned before shows up to undercut some of what I think people perceive as him hating these characters. For example, I love the epic and tragic sweep of using Swan Lake and how overblown it is in this section. That has to be a joke on himself and everyone else. Little things like that in there make me feel like he's kind of taking the edge off of it and he's making clear to you, maybe you don't get the joke all the time, but if you were on his wavelength, you would see, oh, he's taking the piss out of himself. That makes sense. And there's only one John Waters and there only can be. But in this stretch, you talked about it a little bit before, Dawn goes to the city in search of her sister and she does want to be loved and appreciated. She wants to be first for once. I think is what is most important to her. It's a dark turn, yes, definitely, for an already dark movie because Dawn is responsible for endangering her sister significantly if we're just looking at this objectively. She essentially delivers her into the hands of a pedophile out of sheer juvenile spitefulness. It could have had a far worse outcome, though, which is another thing I point to to say, "Eh, he doesn't hate these characters like you think he does. I disagree with you because I think the flip side of that shows that he hates Dawn because he (laughs) continues to give Missy all the luck. 
Don repeatedly says, you're so lucky. You don't even know you're so lucky. Because statistically, this kidnapping would have resulted in, at the very least, Missy's sexual abuse. But instead, it's become more of an extended play date. Even just in her mind, she's going to get through it just fine. And it just reinforces this ingrained feeling and the reality that Missy is so lucky, she's going to be endlessly lucky. Just like Steve, they're both going to be fine. Here's where I'm going to disagree back with you. Okay. Because think about characters that you feel the most for. Do you have a sympathy and understanding and an admiration for characters that are lucky or characters that have fortitude and soldier on no matter what? I know you want me to say B, but I'm going to say A, just to be a contrarian. I point to the films that come next, too, as a way to demonstrate this. In Happiness, Salon's definitely demonstrated that he's willing to go much farther and much darker. Yeah, I am not ready for that movie. From a traditional Ozzy and Harriet standpoint, it's clearly a case with Don of be careful what you wish for. But does Don take that lesson from it, do you feel like? Is she more motivated by saving and protecting her sister or just generally saving the day and receiving the accolades for being a hero? I think she would be totally fine if Missy never came back. And then she would have to live with that for the next several decades, and she would probably still be fine. I think, again, she wants to make her own place. And whatever that is, the hero or the only remaining daughter, who knows? Well, either way, in typical Don Wiener fashion, she's foiled. They find Missy and Don is in trouble. And they tell this 11-year-old girl to call back later from New York City where she is by herself. Yeah, and really she's not in that much trouble right now because they just don't really care that much. But it all gets wrapped up. And so now, after all this has happened and referring back to what I was saying about just wanting to get the growing up part of it over with and get on with everything... Do you feel like Don exhibits personal growth throughout the film? I mean, do we know at the time that we've grown up? Do we realize, oh, I've just passed through something? I don't really see her growing up, but I don't see her regressing. We mentioned all those things that we've seen her do, standing up for herself and other people, which is a thankless job. Being scared, but still moving forward. Being brave enough to get dressed up for Steve. She doesn't settle for Ralphie. She still wants to go for Steve. She's still the self-absorbed kid like I think all kids are. She does have an outlet to express her rage, but it's still pretty destructive, even though it's a fine. And I don't really have a problem with the destruction. So personal growth, I'm not too sure. I think Brandon's exit will be something that she will ruminate on. But I think that's about it. Well, I think I gave you a clue as to how I feel about it a little while ago. I feel like she's already advanced beyond a lot of her peers and some of the adults that she interacts with, so they need to catch up with her. Good point. Everyone is a vindictive child in this, including her mother. I do think she exhibits a little growth in this case, which is enough, because what do you want from an 11-year-old? And I think the thing that you point to, Brandon running away too is an excellent point. She is on the periphery of all these things that are happening around her that are beyond her years. They're forcing her to grow up in a way, but that's how it happens, right? These things ambush us and either we're ready or we're not, but likely we're somewhere in between. So at the very end, we see her taking stock of all of this and trying to play the angles and prepare herself and just move ahead. And she asks her brother in that opening scene that we did, is eighth grade better than seventh. And time just moves so fast at that age. You mentioned the presentation you gave when you were 14 and maybe the difference between 11 years old and 14. The difference between even 11 and 12 can be enormous. So what is it that helps you persevere? Is it that you are just looking so far down the road you're not focused on these things? I just kept my head down or I think maybe I just became bossier. I asserted (laughs) myself more. I don't know what other people did, and I hope it did not end terribly for them. Well, when we last see her, she's on the bus, singing through the pain, keeping her eyes trained, I think, far down the road, far into the future. I like to think maybe she has some weird plan for Disney World. (laughs) That would be perfect. Break the rules somehow. Well, it's not a kid's film as we traditionally think of them, but you did mention this a little bit I think far at the beginning of the show, do you think there are things here that a younger viewer, maybe a viewer Don's age, could actually process and find helpful or instructive here? 
Well, Heather Matarazzo suggested it should be shown in schools and including to parents who don't have any sort of clue as to what is actually going on in their kids' lives. I would say if I saw it at that age, I think I would have been extra terrified of putting a wrong foot anywhere and becoming a target. So personally, I'm glad I stuck to kid adventure. (laughs) And as I said, I would say if you're that age, maybe do it within a therapeutic environment. I really do honestly prefer to stick to the idea that things get better. So don't start with this film because there's no sense that it does. Maybe graduate to this film. Yeah, I find it incredibly ironic to think that parents anywhere wouldn't show this to their kids because it's basically saying, here, let's protect you from something made exclusively of the things that you endure every day. I like that Heather Matarazzo was the one that was pushing for that. I think I read similar things. She felt the script was too safe to be an accurate representation of what she was going through as a preteen. It would have had to be more harsh. Yeah. At that age, she was saying this. Yeah. It's something different than, say, a Pixar movie where there are the kid jokes and then the grown up jokes that are specifically inserted to entertain and relieve the adults that are invariably made to take their kids to those movies. I'm thinking more about something that isn't winking to the adults while it aims over the kids' heads, but actually intentionally includes the kids in these more advanced concepts. Sometimes even concepts that they might not quite be ready for at the time. What I'm trying to communicate with that Pixar example is something that even just has the slightest tinge of being patronizing to kids. That's what I want to avoid because it doesn't give them the full credit they deserve, which I think plays into that I can't wait to grow up concept. It makes me think of a character that straddles that border successfully without being condescending, something like Pee Wee Herman. I don't know. I'm worried that we're getting into a little bit of a Buckminster Fuller experiment. (laughs) So I guess let everybody decide for themselves. Okay, you big killjoy. Well, I mentioned in the last episode about how I'm not the biggest fan of coming of age movies. And I think this film shines a light on why simply because of what it doesn't offer. It offers no reassurances, like you say, especially those reassurances that are built around the idea of a bland universal experience. No two people grow up the same way or have to struggle through the same things. And the desire for it all to work out like a John Hughes movie is just something completely foreign to me. I love this movie specifically because it doesn't try to smooth over the chaos and make everything into a commercial. The tonal balance that it strikes, if you want to call it that, Do you feel like this is inappropriately mature, distressingly juvenile, a mixture, something else? Everything right in the right places. Well, people say it's one of the cruelest films about adolescence. Are they just trying to come to grips with understanding that it's one of the most accurate and they just don't have the wherewithal or the lexicon to express that? Yes, most accurate and incredibly bleak. He said he was looking for the appropriate level of bleakness, and I think he found it. And like I said before, it's accurate for other people. It's accurate for Steve and Missy. They're going to be fine. Well, I'm glad you brought up how much he fine-tuned it, actually. He went through several drafts of this until I think he found just the perfect expression for all these ideas. So let's talk a little bit about Salon's before and after this. I said earlier, I've said it a couple times, I think that he doesn't hate these characters. I wholly believe that. But if we do want to draw distinctions, he did take what feels to me like a hard left with happiness and he just kept going. And the distinction that I want to clarify is that after Welcome to the Dollhouse, he leaves little to no room for innocence in the same way. And I think that may be what people are picking up on. And I think audiences actually resent that, which is ridiculous to me. This is my first and only of his, so I'm going to defer to you. Well, I think you've read similar things that I have about him. He said that making movies, it takes a lot out of him, and it's not a process that he particularly enjoys. So the story he's telling, it has to be important enough to justify putting himself through all that. And to me, being who I am, they serve a very necessary purpose for me, too. I love him for how he completely eviscerates suburban complacency and especially the self-satisfaction. Two targets that will forever need taking down. There is this dumb article that I read in The Guardian about the film Wiener Dog, a continuation of this character's story somewhat, and it just underlines for me how much he's actually stuck to his guns this whole time. All this hand-wringing about, has Todd Salon's gone too far? Bollocks. If you think that, 
You never got him in the first place. These are the types of people that write these articles that love John Waters now, but if they had been contemporaries of his in the beginning, they would have been writing strongly worded letters to the editor, protesting his films in the strongest possible terms. So you're saying you choose these kinds of movies over, say, when Adam Sandler decides he wants to go on vacation and they make the movie there from whatever topic they decide on. If I have to pick between the two, I'll pick Todd Salons, but I don't want to slam Adam Sandler because what he's doing is just fine for him and his friends, and they're even entertaining to me sometimes. I thought Lauren Lapkus in The Wrong Missy was freaking hilarious. Yeah, you're right. And you know I love Will Ferrell in uh, The Song of Fire. But I think these people writing these articles, they refer to his, him being Todd Salons, his misanthropy as verging on pornographic. Can you imagine a grown person who is even faintly familiar with how this world works writing that seriously? Grow up. To that person, I say, I hope Salons keeps rubbing your nose in this for years to come. I think I know the answer to this already because I think you've addressed it a little bit as we've gone, but putting this off all this time, how was the experience overall? Did putting it off for two decades make a huge difference? I don't really have a way of answering that, but... I'm so glad that I finally got to it. I probably could have gotten to it earlier, but I think this was a perfect time. It was a joyful experience. I can't wait to watch it again. I could watch this over and over. Well, how about a recommendation then? Do you have something else we can watch over and over? I went through a couple of options like I always do, and I chose the one that reflects what I might have turned out to be if enough of those microaggressions piled up. And I chose Carrie from 1976. (laughs) Directed by Brian De Palma and adapted from the Stephen King novel, strange that we mentioned him earlier, of the same name. It stars Sissy Spacek, Piper Laurie, Amy Irving, Nancy Allen, and William Catt. And it chronicles the torments at school and at home of our titular Carrie. Funny now that you run down that cast list, I think everyone but Sissy Spacek has the exact same hair, including William Catt. You are so right, and they had your hair, I think, <laughs> my, when you were that age. My high school hair? Yep. Carrie is a 16-year-old who is constantly mocked and bullied by her peers, and her mom is a real piece of work, too. I don't have telekinetic powers. Thankfully, Carrie does. But this film is super scary and super gory and super stylish. And based on some of our discussion for Dollhouse, I was most inspired by that prom presentation scene And how Carrie hears it one way and turns the tables on everyone, including those who genuinely want to support her and be her friends. Well, I went a decidedly different direction, even though the person who directs the film that I chose is a well-respected horror director. I chose Kinney and Company from 1976, and that's directed by Don Coscarelli. It stars Dan McCann, A. Michael Baldwin, and Reggie Bannister, the latter two of which would reconnect with Coscarelli to make Phantasm a couple of years later. It's the story of a group of friends just doing the things that 12-year-olds do, hanging out. It touches on a number of themes that Welcome to the Dollhouse does. Bullies, those first crush feelings, questions about mortality. Plus, it has the added benefit for me of also being set in the few days leading up to Halloween, so it's super fun. It, again, is a much more gentle film than Salons's, but I don't think it is dishonest in any way or it pulls punches necessarily. That feeling is predominantly just because this film comes from an earlier, much less complicated and sophisticated era, I think. It feels very much like the best after-school special, and it is the epitome of the 70s, from the iron-on t-shirts to the station wagons everywhere that you would now see a minivan, right down to the complete and alarming disregard for safety of all kinds. Gun safety, skateboard safety, vehicle safety, having your adolescent lead jump through this thing you built earlier today and set on fire safety. It is glorious. I love this movie. If you need a little relief from the intensity of something like Welcome to the Dollhouse, but you still want to take a look back at riding your bikes and getting home just before the streetlights come on, then this is the film for you. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Carrie and Kenny and Company. And that brings us to the end of episode 137. Again, happy fifth anniversary to us. Yay! If what we do here is valuable to you, and you would like to support that, like I mentioned at the top, we would love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern. 
The $5 a month level, it gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore casts, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Spencer Seams at the We Cut Heads podcast, Jesse Dampolo, Marco Waller, Laura Cannon at the Fatal Films podcast, the fine gentleman at Fuds on Film, Andy Wolverton, and Mike Scharf. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 